Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to discuss with you how viruses, and in particular animal viruses, infect animals, us in particular, and how they reproduce. In other words, um, how do they infect us, and how does this work? You know, I, I will add to this um, introduction that most of our understanding began with, with viruses, bacteriophages, because they were easy to work with, uh, they were not contagious to humans, and we really learned a lot. But the truth is, uh, physicians, uh, scientists are most interested in animal viruses, uh, especially as those that study how they infect humans and how we can slow them down, different pharmaceuticals. And so I think this discussion is, um, a bit sobering, but it, I think it's essential for our background to understand this. In other words, you know, why do we need vaccinations? Um, what's the story with uh, influenza? What causes the symptoms? And, and do, uh, should I be worried about uh, particular um, viruses such as uh, HIV and uh, Ebola? So I hope you'll enjoy this video. And so one of the things that I'll say is that animal viruses are extremely diverse in terms of how they infect uh, and how they replicate, but basically it's the same sort of scheme of uh, that were or variations of a basic scheme that we're working with. And so one of the ways in which there's some derivation is the fact that some animal viruses can be classified by their nucleic acid. Some of the animal viruses are single-stranded DNA, some of them are double-stranded DNA, some of them are double-stranded RNA and single-stranded RNA. And so that, that's one of the ways in which there's some diversity. And whether or not the animal virus is just has a protein capsid surrounding its nucleic acid, or whether or not that capsid is there also surrounded by a membranous envelope, which is uh, usually contains some sort of glycoproteins for attachment. So that's going to be the big differences. So. Um, if you wanted to, you could pause the video at this time and take a look at this. These are some typical virus viruses over here that are double-stranded, and these are the diseases that they cause. Here's some single-stranded DNA, some double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, uh, and then here's some you know different classes as well. Single-stranded RNA that's uh, a template for messenger RNA synthesis. I'll mention what that means. Uh, Great examples here are e Ebola itself, influenza virus, and then again, over here, uh, single-stranded RNA, um, which at, acts as a retrovirus because it sort of goes in reverse and then copies itself into DNA. And so HIV is infamous for being a retrovirus. And so let's look at this. Uh, I, let me direct your attention to another video on viral structure, but let me just basically cover it if you don't mind. Um, what we have is these proteins called capsids that sur surround nucleic acid. And then sometimes these capsids can even be surrounded by a, a membranous envelope. So a phospholipid bilayer with proteins embedded. And uh, the flu virus is an example of a membranous virus. So some of these viruses have um, envelopes that sort of um, cloak or cover their capsids, okay? And then, you know, where, do that, where does the membrane come from? It comes from the host that they're replicating inside. So when they butt off, they incorporate that membrane of the host cell into their own membranous envelope. So one thing that's most important to, to discover right out of the gate is that viruses can only reproduce, emphasize this, only reproduce within the host cell. So why is that? Well, it's because a virus in and of itself is basically just a protein and some kind of nucleic acid inside. And so it, it doesn't have the ability to reproduce on its own. Uh, it lacks, most of them lack the enzymes necessary for metabolism. They don't have any polymerase enzymes per se. Uh, they certainly uh, have no ribosomes, so they wouldn't be able to generate their own protein or replicate their own nucleic acid. So they're basically an intercellular parasite. So in other words, if here's the host cell membrane, the virus needs to uh, enter into, when I say enter, I mean nucleic acid needs to enter into the host cell 
and then the host cell basically becomes a viral factory and makes more viruses. And so that's how they reproduce inside the animal cell. There's a little bit more of a detailed discussion of this. And so the virus uh, begins when the capsid uh, or membranous envelope uh, unites with particular and specific receptor proteins on the cell membrane of the host. Then the, the first phase of the, of the infection is that the capsid is broken down, the nucleic acid comes out, and then the virus nucleic acid, in this picture it's, it's DNA, but the viral nucleic acid then gets replicated for future viruses. And the nucleic acid gets transcribed into messenger RNA, and then, again, very insidiously, the, the cell then translates the viral messenger RNA into viral proteins, and then those assemble and then uh, are released from the host cell. And so once the, the viral genome commandeers the host, it sort of reprograms the, the cell into making more viruses. And so this usually causes uh, trouble for the cell and ultimately the, the demise of the cell and damage to the cell. And so um, then the nucleic acid of the virus is then enclosed and then it exits the cell. And so sometimes, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, some of the viruses have it, the capsid in the nucleic acid, but they're surrounded by this membranous envelope. And then that helps to uh, attach to specific receptors on the cell membrane not shown. Usually that envelope becomes part of the host cell membrane and just the capsid goes inside. And then the capsid breaks down and the nucleic acid is then replicated. More proteins are produced. Some of those proteins, glycoproteins, uh, are coded for on genes within the viral nucleic acid, and then those are brought by the uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum through transport vesicles to the plasma membrane, and then when the capsid forms inside, that then, then attaches to the plasma membrane of the host, and that's how the membrane gets reincorporated in an animal cell virus. So these enveloped viruses usually don't kill the host, host cell uh, immediately. They sort of use the cell as a, uh, as a means of replication, and so you don't want really the cell to die immediately. And so again, um, the viral genome is then, okay, here's more detail, the envelope uh, becomes part of the cell membrane, the capsid comes in, there's replication of the, ge of the genome, and again, uh, these are the glycoproteins that will eventually appear on the outside of, of the membrane. Those get put on the outside of the cell membrane, and then when the capsid is ready to bud out, then the envelope surrounds it, and this new virus is ready to go on and dominate and destroy as many host cells as possible. And so after the capsid and viral genome assemble, as I was mentioning just a second ago, the virus buds away, and that includes the host membrane with it, but it's not completely the host membrane, it's, it's viral proteins attached that the cell was able to make. And so this is a picture of the, the bud uh, excising from the cell. Now, depending on the nucleic acid, viruses use different means, and this is a part of that diversity that I was alluding to earlier. And it's like, well, you know, what di quite diverse. Well, in some cases, if the RNA is single-stranded, the genome acts as, as the messenger RNA. So when it comes in, it's like that is the, the messenger RNA that's translate, translated directly. In other cases, this is just for curiosity purposes, in other cases, the RNA genome serves as a template, then it's transcribed into messenger RNA. Okay, and so then um, you could use that to go back and then make more uh, copies of the genome as well. And then in some instances, RNA can, uh, can make messenger RNA, which is used uh, to produce viral enzymes. Okay, so uh, all of this is all sort of just a little bit of, a, you know, again, variation. But I do want to emphasize this particular type of RNA virus. It's, it's a class uh, six retrovirus, and it has one of the more complicated life cycles, and so I want to discuss it. 
this particular type of virus, often a single stranded RNA, carries with it an enzyme, and that's kind of unusual. It carries an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And so if you could picture this, here we have the virus, and it has single-stranded RNA, and it has the enzyme reverse transcript single-stranded RNA, and it has the enzyme reverse transcriptase with it. And so that's going to be important because that's going to reverse transcription. That's going to turn the viral RNA using reverse transcriptase to viral DNA. Okay, and I'm going to give an example of that. And what happens is when the viral DNA is, is produced with reverse transcriptase, then the, ver then the viral DNA can actually become incorporated and integrated into the host cell chromosome where it can re replicate along with the cell. So the host RNA polymerase will transcribe that viral DNA into more and more RNA molecules. So that, so that's typically normal. And then that can function as either messenger RNA to make more viral proteins or viral genome once the virus is uh, released from the cell. And so here's a, a computer um, enhanced uh, interpretation of an x-ray crystallography of reverse transcriptase. You can see it's a rather complex enzyme. It's highly studied because we would like to inhibit it as much as we can which would be some sort of viral medication. If we, if, you know, normally our cells don't have reverse transcriptase, so if we could interfere with its function, uh, we're going to slow replication. And so there are some phar pharmaceuticals that can do that. Uh, here's the alpha helix, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, what does this enzyme do? It can take viral RNA, uh, of course you need nucleotides, and reverse it into viral DNA. And again, that's called reverse because normally transcription is DNA to RNA. So it's kind of kind of curious, okay? And so the enzyme or the virus that I want to discuss in this video that is a re retrovirus and uses reverse transcriptase is um, human immunodeficiency virus, which you might know as HIV. And it's what causes AIDS. Which, which is acquired immune deficiency syndrome. It's a retrovirus. And so basic look at the structure of this HIV virus. It's, it, is an, uh, it has an envelope, so it has a membrane, and it has glycoproteins sticking out. These proteins help it attach to the host cell. It also has a, with not so well drawn here, but it has a matrix protein and a capsid protein. The capsid protein is the one that directly surrounds the nucleic acid. And in this case, it has two copies of single-stranded RNA, and it also packs with it two copies of the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Okay, and so a lot is known about uh, HIV, needless to say. And so not only does it, I, let me add one more thing, not only does it have two copies of RNA to reverse transcriptase, and I'm going to add to the drawing, it also has an enzyme called integrase. And that enzyme is going to be important when it comes time to integrate the viral DNA into the host cell chromosome. So that's important. Okay. So let's take a look at this. Again, a cartoon drawing of HIV. These are the glycoproteins that are sitting on the envelope. Okay. The cell in particular that HIV likes to attack is one of our white blood cells. It's called a lymphocyte. It's called a T lymphocyte. And so HIV, if I will draw it here, not quite to scale, HIV will attach to this particular type of cell. And what it'll do is it'll eventually replicate inside and it will bud off and make more viruses but ultimately it'll cause the demise of the lymphocyte. And so it's called immune deficiency because after a while of infection, your immune system is compromised because no longer are your T cells working efficiently. Now, it's, it's not any T cell, it's a helper T cell, it's a CD4 helper T cell, but I don't want to get into that level of de detail. But it's this particular uh, cell. 
And again, this is the light microscope. This is blood, if you don't recognize it, the plasma. These are red blood cells, white blood cell. But check it out. If you took that same T cell and use a scanning electron microscope, these little blue dots, you can get and see a little bit better scale. These are all HIV attaching to the outside of the cell membrane. And so this is that, see this cell right here? Uh, that's this big yellow guy right there. So this is a great photograph right there. So here's HIV entering into the cell. And I'm going to conclude the video with showing a little video clip showing some, some excellent animation on this. So HIV attaches to these receptor proteins on the outside of the T helper cell called CD4, cell, cellular determinant 4 proteins. And basically the capsid comes inside, it's broken up, and then the viral RNA, with the help of the enzyme reverse transcriptase, makes a single copy of viral DNA, and then it repeats it again and makes the double-stranded DNA. And then with the help of that enzyme integrase, the viral DNA becomes incorporated, and that's why it's a lifelong infection. It becomes incorporated into the chromosomes of the T cell which means it's going to replicate along with that. And then it produces viral messenger RNA, which then makes more viral proteins with the help of the cell's ribosomes, brutally, and the cell's amino acids. It'll make more capsid proteins, and then it'll basically fuse with the cell membrane, detailed to come in the video. And then HIV is then released with, these, with the envelope and these viral glycoproteins that were produced inside the cell. So that's a brief outline of, of the HIV replication pattern, but it's typical of most retroviruses in that they employ this enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which converts viral RNA to viral DNA. Okay, And so transcription then makes more copies, as I was saying, of more proteins, and then they assemble and then bud off. Here's an, here's an actual transmission electron microscope photograph of, of the um, virus assembling and then budding off the, off the T cell. Incredible. Okay, and so, you know, you know, people, again, you know, we're looking at detail here, but most people think of, gee, when I have a viral inf infection, I have a, 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 the flu, I have all these symptoms. I have, like, I, I don't, I have a sore throat or I have a running nose, um, or maybe I have a fever. And so a lot of times what, what's causing these symptoms can be a little obscure, but it's basically when the virus is damaged, the, the cells, like for example, if it's, a, if it's a flu virus, if it's attacking the respiratory system, it's gonna be damaging those cells, and that's what's gonna cause um, inflammation, which is gonna result in uh, runny nose, redness, uh, it's going to result in if it's infecting your throat, sore throat, and it can actually cause you know damage again. Um, and some of the cells can actually produce some some toxins, which lead to some symptoms as well. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, when you get better, uh, the cells reproduce rather quickly, and and you get over it. Um, but then in some can cases where the virus is infecting neurons, it can actually be permanent damage in the case of polio, which is rather brutal. It can leave a person really uh, damaged as a result of that. And so what, what, what is our body doing? Well, you know, what's interesting is our own body's de defensive system can actually result in some symptoms as well. Like when there's a viral infection, we like to increase the body temperature, which results in a fever. Um, our B lymphocytes, okay, B lymphocytes, type of white blood cell, will secrete uh, these uh, antibodies, uh, which are plasma proteins, gamma globulins, which then can go out and actually bind to the glycoproteins of virus, which make them unable to at attack our own cells. And so our own body tries to fight off the viruses. And so, um, However, as a result, it causes some symptoms, again, like the fever, and it can actually cause some cellular damage uh, when this war is raging. And what I mean by that is, um, if this is one of our body cells, if our cell is infected by a virus, it's difficult for these antibodies 
to attack the virus because this needs to be circulating in the, in the tissue fluid. So what will happen is if a cell is being infected and viruses are replicating inside, what the cell will do is it's sort of like a bank robbery. If the bank's being robbed, it'll put a little light on the outside and so if a patrol car comes by, it'll be like, hey, hey, somebody's robbing the bank. Maybe I'll just drive by and throw a grenade in there and blow the whole cell up <laughs> or blow the whole bank up and kill the bank robbers. So this is what happens kind of. Uh, we have a, a cell called a, a T lymphocyte. It's a cytotoxic T or TC cell. And what it'll do is it'll attach to one of these um, major histocompatibility complexes on the outside of the cell that actually is altered because the cell's being infected by a virus. And so when it senses that, it attaches, it releases a chemical called perforin, which then causes perforation in the cell membrane of the infected cell. And then the cell, uh, again, is vulnerable to osmosis and water enters in and the cell pops and kills the cell. Now that's gonna, that's gonna result in like pain soreness and achy, these kinds of symptoms. Oh, I'm sick. I get you know, a fever. I'm achy. I'm sore. But in the end, this is what's battling uh, the virus because then these viral particles either do not replicate or they, if they do, they come outside and they're attacked by antibodies. So kind of cool. If we don't want the virus in particular, maybe we can become vaccinated. If you're familiar with this, uh, modern medicine has developed vaccinations. Uh, which can sort of tip the immune system and say, hey, look out for this particular virus. And so you don't want to give the person the infection, but if you can give the person just the, the outer envelope or the glycocalyx, just the, the outer, sometimes sorry for all the terms, but the outer antigen of the virus, what that would do, in, in other words, a, a small amount, a very weakened amount of the germ or the virus, what the body will do, it, it, it'll, uh, it'll discover this, like B cells will then replicate and replicate and replicate like this, and it'll give the body a chance when you're not even sick to develop a clonal army against this. And so when the germ actually comes around for real, these B cells can produce a tremendous amount of antibodies very rapidly, and then you don't get sick. It's brilliant. And so if you're not familiar with this story, uh, I in, invite you to read more about it. I'm going to cover it very briefly. Edward Jenner, perhaps the gr one of the greatest discoveries of all time. Uh, physician in the 1700s, uh, milkmaids, he noticed, were these are women that were milking cows, would get sick by uh, picking up something called cow cowpox. The cows would have these little pustules and they get sick and fever, but it wasn't fatal. But there was a disease that was killing literally millions during this time called smallpox. And, but he noticed something uh, in, in, his, in, his, uh, in his office that the women who had cowpox were immune to smallpox. And it's like, oh my God. And he figured it was because they had cowpox. And so what he did was he literally scraped a little bit of the cowpox uh, so in other words, a little bit of the virus that causes cowpox, and he deliberately infected a little boy with this, and sure enough, the boy developed immunity to smallpox. And so smallpox, again, one of the world killers. It's very, very brutal. And so vaccinations, we have vaccinations for all sorts of things now. And so um, because of its similarity, it allowed the boy to become uh, immune and therefore react very vigorously to smallpox. So one of the great discoveries ever in biology. So they they pre they prevent is the key word viral infections, but they don't really cure it. So you can't take a vaccination once you once you got the flu. I just want to emphasize that. And you, and you can't use antibiotics either. These these come from um, fungus that kill bacteria. Okay, and so this isn't really what we're talking about. Their antibiotics are sort of powerless against viruses. And it's like, well, what do we have? We have no defenses. Well, we're developing them currently, antiviral medications. And so one of them in particular is that I want to emphasize fairly recently discovered is something called AZT. You might have heard of it. Well, if viruses are replicating in our cell, 
they're basically stealing our own nucleotides to do so. So if you give a person defective nucleotides, and so this is a, if you're familiar with this basic structure of a, of a nucleotide, here's a nitrogen base, here's the sugar, here's a phosphate not shown over here. But what's interesting is this particular um, synthesized nucleic acid is non-functional. Do you notice here on the three prime hydroxyl, uh, three prime carbon, there's normally a hydroxyl group, but in this instance, it has a nitrogen on it, which means that if you gave this person met, um, this chemical called AZT, they would not be able to replicate their DNA or their virus wouldn't be able to replicate. And so it'll cause the cell and the virus to die. Now this could be fatal, so it has to be administered properly. And so I just wanted to point out that, you know, there's been some horrific viruses over the years, and I don't think we're going to see the end of them because, you know, one of them, as HIV, as I have been discussing, and we'll finish with a video, sort of appeared in, in, in earnest in the 1980s and it's been with us since. And, you know, every year the flu is trouble. And again, um, that is complicated because the flu, it, it mutates, it changes, our body isn't able to react to it properly. And also sometimes we can be inf infected by two different kinds of viruses at the same time and, that, and there can be recombination of DNA and create this sort of un really unusual viruses. This is, and then Ebola virus, which, which is shown here, which causes um, a lot of trouble and, and uh, a lot of death, it was really uh, picking up in Central Africa in around the 1970s. But again, most recently, it's emerging, and there's literally thousands of, of, of deaths in West Africa in, uh, in, the, in the current uh, time, 2015. And so just wanted to say it's always good to know your animal viruses and how they work. And so let me conclude with this video on HIV in particular. I think it's one of the best ones um, created on this. And so let's take a look at this. So this is HIV. It's a typical retrovirus, meaning that it has an outer envelope. And in the center, it has two copies of RNA, as well as an enzyme here in blue that's reverse transcriptase, which will ultimately turn that RNA into DNA. Um, the, the virus itself, with this outer envelope protein, uh, actually directly infects T helper cells. The way that it does this is that as it comes up to the cell surface, it uses receptors that are on T helper cells and exclusive to T helper cells, which are CD4 molecule, which really defines T helper cells. So this is the glycoprotein right here of the envelope of HIV, and it's attaching to a receptor protein on the T cell. This is a white blood cell of our own body. It's a surface receptor that binds to the envelope protein. It, that causes a conformational change and allows a second receptor to grab hold of the envelope. This is the chemokine co-receptor. It's also called CCR5, and we'll talk about that more. What so there's various medications uh, that are out there that try to block CD4 and chemokine receptors to prevent HIV from binding to the T cell. What happens now is that the, the, the stalk of the envelope protein Check that out. pierces through the, uh, from the virus into the, into the host cell and starts to draw the two cell membrane, the cell membrane and the viral membrane together. And what ultimately happens is fusion of those two membranes and the viral genetic material is injected essentially into the cell and the envelope protein is left at the cell surface. The virus so here you're going to see the, the, the virus matrix protein and capsid protein then disintegrate. The virus has a matrix and a capsid protein shown here in green and red that, that essentially are digested when it enters into the cell. That releases viral enzymes and the viral RNA. And here we have reverse transcriptase, which takes the viral RNA and using host nucleotides, converts that viral RNA into a single strand of DNA. While it does that, it makes some random errors, which is characteristic of reverse transcriptase. It has very poor proofreading activity. And that's what makes the virus particularly dangerous as well, because 
the more mutations, the more elusive it is to our immune system. So this is why it's called a, uh, a retrovirus, is because it's taking viral RNA and turning it into viral DNA. That single-stranded DNA now is again reverse transcribed into a double-stranded DNA. At that point, another enzyme that has come in with the virus in the beginning called integrase essentially grabs hold of that double-stranded DNA and carries it through a nuclear pore into the nucleus of the cell. Within the nucleus of the cell, it finds the host chromosome and it basically, the integrase enzyme, makes a nick in the host DNA and allows for HIV to insert itself into the host chromosome. And that right there is what establishes lifelong infection. Your prophase. Now, RNA polymerase comes along and makes messenger RNA. It's viral messenger Those messenger RNA. RNAs encode for different viral proteins. They end up associating with ribosomes on the, at the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And here's a piece of mRNA that's making envelope protein, which is directly produced into the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's shuttled then through the endoplasmic reticulum and taken to the cell surface, where at the cell surface, it becomes embedded in the cellular membrane. And at this point, coalescing with other envelope proteins that have been produced, you have this cluster of envelope proteins now on the surface of this infected cell. Now, when the virus buds from that T uh, cell, it's going to then have this on the outside, if you're following that. At the same time, there are other messenger RNAs that are being produced that allow for translation of other uh, viral proteins. So here are additional viral proteins being made, which are going to be used to make up the key components that, uh, that the virus ultimately is going to need. These are transported again to the cell surface, to the area where these envelope proteins are, and a strand of RNA as well as a, some of the enzymes are part of that complex. Right there. This then buds off at the cell surface at this point, but it's still not a mature virion because the polyprotein chain needs to still be digested into its component parts. So this That's is done by... This is kind of interesting. So uh, part of the matrix proteins and capsid proteins, uh, there it's made in one big long chain of various proteins, and so it, those those have to be like cut into smaller subunits. And an enzyme that does this inside the virus envelope is an enzyme called protease. I don't know if you've heard this before, but we have, a, a, again, another whole class of pharmaceutical medications that we've discovered or actually synthesized that will block up the active site and inhibit this protease enzyme. So they're called protease inhibitors. So if you give a person protease inhibitors, the viruses, when they leave an infected person, don't function normally because they their proteins can't be cut up. So it's pretty cool an enzyme called protease. Protease breaks up those uh, polyprotein chains and ultimately allows for them to coalesce and form the mature uh, structures that make up the final virion. And now you have a mature infectious virion that can go on now to infect other cells. So, you know, I, again, I think there's a lot of hope, a lot of great scientists working in the area of HIV, developing anti- uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, antiprotease inhibitors, these kinds of things. So I hope you enjoyed this brief look at animal viruses and how they replicate. Thanks for watching.